today I have the pleasure of introducing Tom Parkinson to lead our workshop on uh, customer acquisition costs and customer lifetime value. Uh, Tom is not a stranger to the university or to our ecosystem. Um, he's been part of Illinois Ventures as a senior director for a number of years. And as many of you will know that Illinois Ventures is the university's venture capital arm and has invested in many of your companies. Um, but Tom also has this other hat that he wears that I think brings a certain level of depth to uh, leading workshops like this, which is uh, teaching I, an IMBA course in entrepreneurship at the East College of Business um, and perennially uh, a large uh, course with thousands of students enrolled. Um, so with that, please join me in uh, welcoming Tom Parkinson. Thanks. Um, so I was here in, I was trying to remember when I was here doing what used to be the first half of this uh, presentation, but we split, I split it into two. And I realized that was before the Eclipse, because we were talking about the price of Eclipse classes as, a, as an example of uh, dynamic pricing um, or variable pricing. And so it's been since April, so it's been a little while. So what I want to talk about today is um, so understanding a little bit about your business and metrics. Um, how many of you, how many of you feel that you have a pretty good handle on your KPIs for your business, your key performance indicators? Raise your hand if you think you're pretty good. Nobody? Nobody? I was talking with a group of entrepreneurs in Nebraska last week and like half of them raised their hand. What's, you can't let Nebraska entrepreneurs. <laughs> better at this than we are. Um, so uh, um, how many of you feel that you've got like a ton of data about what's going on in your business because you don't know what to make of it or you don't really know how to use it to make decisions? Okay, all right. Well, um, there's a number of metrics that you're probably tracking every day in your business. Here are probably some of them. A bunch of you are probably familiar with these. Uh, your sales can bring, these are all uh, um, intended to be measures to sort of uh, measure the effectiveness and scalability of your business model and your sales and marketing uh, initiatives. So, excuse me. So your sales conversion rate, that is the percent of prospects that you contact that actually end up eventually buying from you. How many of you feel that you have sort of a handle on that? Or how many of you just don't have any customers yet, so you don't know? That's the second, okay. Um, if, you're, um, if it's an e-commerce or an online business, it's the percentage of visitors that you get to your website that click that Buy Now button and become your customers. How many of you have a freemium business model where you make your product available for free for a while or for some limited number of users and then you try to convert them into paying customers later. How many of you do that? Really nobody. Why? Just nobody does anything. Have any of you actually got businesses yet? <laughs> okay. All right. Uh, but that would be the percentage in this case of the actual free users you have that convert into becoming paying customers. The thing I like to say about freemium models is if that's what you're doing, then you have to keep in mind that your free users are not your customers. They are your leads, your sales leads, and you now have to sell to them to convince them to be. And so don't think about them as your customers. They're people that you need to convert into being customers. Um, how many of you are worried about churn in your businesses? I can't get anybody to raise their hand for anything for this presentation. This is going to be a long presentation. Um, and that, so your churn rate, that's the percentage of customers that, um, uh, that you have in one period of time, a month, a year, if you're talking about an annual or a monthly churn, that are no longer your customers a month or a year later. Make sense? Same thing, and, it, and, and it's also in a subscription model. It's the number of people that cancel their subscriptions or don't renew their prescription subscriptions when, um, when the initial subscription is up. How many of you have viral businesses? Anybody? Who doesn't know what a viral business is? 
Okay, so a viral business is one where your value proposition becomes stronger if people actually, if your customers actually encourage other people to come in and be your customers as well. So a social media platform is a prime example of that. But a viral just simply means that every customer that you bring in, you can have an expectation that that customer is actually going to bring additional customers. So it's the, it's the number of new customers that each existing customers, customer is likely to bring into your business. I'm going to spend most of the talk today talking about customer acquisition costs and customer lifetime value. Because really these, all those, everything we just saw on those last two slides kind of feeds into customer acquisition costs and customer lifetime value. A lot of people will say that these are really the key metrics that you need to be tracking in your business to confirm that you've really got a, a repeatable and scalable business model, the kind of business model that has the potential for rapid growth, that can raise money from equity investors or venture capital investors, uh, and so on. And a lot of startup entrepreneurs are super intimidated by the idea of trying to figure out what's their cost of acquisition, customer acquisition, or what's their customer lifetime value. They have no idea, not only do they not know what it is, Many of them don't even know how they're going to go about calculating it when they do that information. Anybody in that situation? All right, well, I'm going to hopefully I'm going to demystify it a little bit right now because it's not as hard as you think. All right? Your customer acquisition cost is the average cost that you incur to bring on each new customer as your company grows. And the lifetime value of a customer is the expected profit that you can expect to receive from serving that customer over the period of time that that customer is still buying from you or they're subscribing from you or whatever it might be. So, customer acquisition cost. Sounds intimidating. Some of you might not even have any customers yet and you've been spending tons of money trying to get customers and uh, so you've got no idea. But ultimately, in any given period, a month, a year, a week, whatever time period, time period you're looking at, your customer acquisition cost is your total sales and marketing expense divided by the number of new customers that you actually bring in during that period of time. How many of you can look at a financial statement and see what your sales and marketing expenses are? Everybody, right? Yeah. Well, this is not, not that hard, really, to calculate. The one thing you do have to keep in mind, we're really only talking about sales and marketing expenses that are geared towards acquiring new customers, not like upsells or trying to get somebody to extend their subscription or something like that. It's really your sales and marketing expenses focused on new customers. But for most of you, that's probably almost all of it, right? Um, customer lifetime value, a little more complicated, and sometimes it takes a, some time for you to figure out. Maybe you don't have as much information as you'd like. But that is the price that you're charging for your subscription, or your product, or your service, minus whatever your actual costs are of delivering that product, or service, or subscription per customer, or per unit. <coughs> times the average number of transactions you can expect that customer to do with you over that customer's lifetime. That's a, that's a traditional model. If it's a subscription, then it's your subscription price minus whatever your typical costs are of supporting that subscriber times the average number of months that they're going to continue to subscribe from you before they eventually churn. How many of you have a really, really low churn rate right now? You of you? Anybody like have like zero churn at this point? Everybody eventually churns. There is no such thing as a company with no churn rate. I used to say we were. I, I was an investor in a company that would work with real estate agents, and so every time a real estate agent got a new listing, they would buy from our company. It wasn't really a subscription, but it was a repeat purchase model. But what do you know about real estate agents? A bunch of them are part time. They go in and out of business all the time. You know, so there's all kinds of reasons why somebody might churn. Even if they love your service, 
They just may not have any need for it anymore, and they're going to churn. People eventually die, so everybody has um, some has some churn. This is not my last. What is this like? Oh, okay. So here is yes. I I, I, I was going to use this at the end, and I am still going to use it at the end. But here is just a, like a little mock-up of a very simplified example about how you would go about estimating what your customer acquisition cost and customer lifetime value would be. And I will come back to this slide later. But what you can see here is in a this column is for a traditional business and this column is for a subscription-based business. All right, in the first line is the number of new customers that you brought on that month. And um, oh, let's, say, let's do it by a year just to make it easier. Let's say that this company brings in 100 new customers in that year which brings them up to a total of 250 customers. And the average price they charge for their product is a dollar. Which means you have 250 customers paying a dollar, you've got 250 dollars in total revenue for that year. Make sense? This is not hard yet, right? And then let's say that their direct costs, and by direct I mean the actual costs of producing that and delivering that product not the cost of sales and marketing, not the cost of rent, insurance, or just kind of running the business itself, but the actual direct costs of producing that product. And let's say that was $125 that year, which works out to be 50 cents per customer. Okay? So that means this company has got a contribution margin. That's that total revenue minus the direct costs. Another way to think about it is it's your price minus your direct costs per unit. So, an example I always use is like if I've got a shoe store and I sell a pair of shoes for $60, but the manufacturer sold them to me. I sell a pair of shoes for $100, but the manufacturer sold them to me for $60, then my contribution margin is $40. 40% depending on how you think about it. Make sense? So the direct cost per customer are 50 cents, which means the contribution margin is $125. That's the amount of money this company now has available to pay for its sales and marketing and all of its overhead expenses. And the contribution margin is 50%. Let's say this company spends 50 bucks on sales and marketing that year. All right? Google AdWords, hiring a sales force, you know, whatever their sales and marketing approach was. And each customer on average uh, makes two repeat purchases over time before they eventually go away and they're not your customer anymore. In this case then, um, we take our, cu our customer acquisition cost is $50 spent on sales and marketing divided by the number of new customers, which is 100, that's 50 cents per customer. And our customer lifetime value is um, 120, it's, it's $125 uh, uh, times two, because of the repeat purchases, minus the total, I mean divided by the um, total number of customers, and that comes out to be a, um, uh, lifetime value of a dollar. Make sense? All right. So this is, and, and we now have a ratio where our customer lifetime value is twice as high as our customer acquisition cost. You can work on this with your own numbers. Yeah. So I've seen during the three CAPD is measured using the revenue from the customer rather than the contribution margin. Mm -hmm. uh, maybe because it is difficult to have the cap in the industry, is there a clear distinction or should this be used as a reference in most cases? Um, I would encourage you to, um, depends on the industry. So some industries you have very, very little in the way of like direct costs to serve the customer, like if it's a software business. Yes. And in that case, that would work, that would make a lot of sense. But if you're in a, cut, in a business where cost of goods sold is a serious number that you have to deal with, then my, I would encourage you to approach it this way. Because we're really, you're not in the business of generating revenue, yet, right? How many people here think that that's your primary goal, is to grow your revenue really fast and get lots of customers? 
okay, this guy, he's wrong, but he knows better. It's really about profit. You want profitable customers that are going to mean that you have a viable business that can grow and, and uh, create value for you and for your shareholders, right? Okay, so I would encourage you to think about the contribution market, not um, just pure revenue. Um, if you have a subscription, I've got some similar numbers here. You get 100 new subscribers, which brings you up to 250 total subscribers. It's um, an average subscription price of a buck. Gives you $250 in total revenue. Again, $125 in actual direct costs of supporting that subscribers because it's a SaaS business. That would be a really high number, right? But. Um, and that would uh, translate to 50 cents per customer. So your contribution margin is 50%. Your customer acquisition cost is, oh, your sales, sales and marketing expense is still $50. So your customer acquisition cost is 50 cents. And that lifetime value, because they stay with you an average of two years before they churn, is a dollar. So you get the same ratio. So the point is, this is a pretty simplified example. And the reason I give you this simplified example is so that you can see that this is really not as complicated as a lot of entrepreneurs think it is. This is something that many of you can do now, even when you have very few customers. And even if you don't know how long they're going to continue to subscribe from you, or how many times they're going to come back and make repeat purchases, you can make estimates. I mean, you're doing customer discovery right now, you're talking to them, you're getting a sense of how important your solution is to them and how long they're, they, they think you might, they, they're likely to need it. You can also go to um, publish sources and see, well, what are average churn rates for various kinds of subscription services and things like that. So you can make estimates of what you might be able to expect going forward. And these are all estimates at this point in time. But that's how you take, that's how you approach it. Ultimately, your lifetime value of your customer has to be greater than your customer acquisition cost. If it's not, you don't have a viable business. Most of you, I shouldn't say most, but many of you, probably if you were to do this calculation today, it would be you. Right? Because you hardly have any customers at all, and you're spending a ton of money trying to get everybody doctors, and you know, many of you are like not even making profitable sales yet. So that may be the situation you're in now, but that's not the way you expect this to continue or else you don't have a viable business. You've got to have an action plan to actually make that work. If the lifetime value is a lot higher than your customer acquisition cost, then you've got a business that's scalable. And by scalable, that means, um, how many of you have raised seed capital? Okay, um, Arpit, what's the definition of seed capital? A lot of people. I don't know, there is no formal definition, but what would you say is the definition of seed capital? I don't think there's a definition. It's just like um, nomenclature. The way I would encourage you to think about seed capital is that's money you go out and raise from investors and you don't really have product market fit yet. You're still trying to figure out. You probably are making prototypes. You know, you don't know if it's a, if, if it's a viable business model yet. You're, making about, you're, you're raising money from people who are making really risky investments for a business that might actually just go completely bankrupt because it turns out their idea didn't work at all. Right? That's, that's the way I think about seed capital. And then when you think about traditional venture capital, say a Series A round of financing, that's money that you usually want to use to grow a business that can show that it's got a viable business model. And that is if you're in this case where if you can show your customer lifetime value is higher than your customer acquisition cost, now it's time to go spend money on sales and marketing. All right? Because if you didn't know that, that you could expect each customer to be profitable, why would you spend a lot of money trying to get new customers when it might turn out that it actually defeats the purpose for you? Make sense? Um, I'll also go far enough to say that for a lot of investors, especially venture investors who are looking at Series A and later in rounds, knowing your and being able to communicate your these two fund numbers, customer acquisition cost and lifetime value, that really impresses them. It can set you apart.
from a lot of the other entrepreneurs that they're talking to, give them a lot more confidence that you have a sense of what the ultimate drivers of profitability in your business are going to be, and you know how to use this metric to make decisions about, well, what if I try this new channel for my sales? What if I add these additional features and charge for them in a, in a certain way? And so on and so forth. That, it, it, it can be the difference for a lot of in, in, um, entrepreneurs between having a business plan that's fundable and one that's not. Okay, that's why I encourage you to be thinking about this, even if you don't have much information yet. Um, I'll give you an example here. Um, I thought I had a couple more slides right here. So, um, and maybe there's somewhere else in the presentation. But let me uh, just ask you a second. What if you're, what do you think you could do if you're in a situation where your customer acquisition cost is too high? What are some things that you could do as an entrepreneur? Find a cheaper supply chain with a new product. No, that, that would increase, that, no, that would, no. Customer acquisition cost is about sales and marketing. Sorry about that, I misunderstood the question. Okay, what can you do to reduce your customer acquisition cost if it's too high? Change your marketing strategy. Change your marketing strategy. You might want to go after a different target market than you're currently targeting, somebody that's easier to reach. Maybe you might want to change your channel strategy, find you know, some way to reach your customers less effectively. Maybe you can hire your terrible salespeople and hire people that are going to have a closing rate, a sales closing rate that's a little bit more competitive. Those are the kind of things you need to be thinking about. And I guess the other thing I would say is I would expect for every single one person in this room, as you go forward in the business, in your businesses, your customer acquisition cost will get better over time. Because you just get a little smarter. You learn more, you learn better about what kind of, which kind of customers really need your solution and you don't bother with the other, trying to sell to the others. You get better at communicating, you get better at selling, you get better at figuring out which channels work. Your customer, your customer acquisition should get better over time just because you get better at selling your products or services, right? What do you do if your customer lifetime value is too low? What are some ideas that you could do there? Increase loyalty. You could increase loyalty. You could like do something to um, reduce the churn rate if you have a subscription service, or you can do something to uh, encourage more repeat purchases. I mean, why is it that every time you go to the CVS, you get this long string of <laughs> coupons on your receipt? Uh, offering money off on your next purchase and stuff like that. That's trying to encourage you to come back and buy again and again and again, increase those number of visits in that case. What are some other things that you can do? Raise your prices. Raise your price, right? Assuming that raising your price isn't gonna mean, isn't gonna drive customers away, but most of you are probably not in a situation where raising your prices would drive very many customers away. You guys are all probably hiring I mean, launching innovative, high-quality products or services, right? I think it's more likely most of you are setting prices too low rather than too high. You could also do things like cross-selling and upselling. You could find other ways to monetize your customer. If you've got a subscription-based service, maybe there's something you could do to sell your data. Maybe you could find, maybe you could, you know, create an advertising revenue stream, something like that. So those are all different ways to increase your customer lifetime value. Yes? Would lower your price potentially because it would also be more buy your products? You weren't here in April, were you? <laughs> um, so um, the answer, so what he said is, wouldn't you get more customers if you lower your price? Potentially. The answer to that is what? The answer to that is maybe. Maybe. Not definitely. Okay, and it might be that you could raise your prices and not lose a single customer. Because you have such a high quality service, it's some new technology that your competitors can't provide. I mean, we're in a technology incubator here, right? Many of you have 
are, are creating barriers to entry around your solution that's making it hard for competitors just to match everything you do, right? So the answer to your question is, if you raise your prices, will you lose customers? Maybe. But maybe you should check it out and find out. And so um, how, many, how many of you are actually doing some experimenting on your pricing strategies right now? A few of you? You should be doing that. You should be trying to figure out whether or not it, you really have to raise your prices or lower your prices and make, and, and make good decisions along the way. Yeah? So you mentioned the gap to users and the sales team gets more experience and over time. To show, yes. So is there also an element of something maybe like a network effect as the company is growing, getting more customers, more customers, they have more customers, and more customers. Certainly, certainly. That's one way you get better at selling. So yes, it can be hard to sell a product when your customers have never heard of you before and they don't really have confidence in your ability to deliver. In fact, some big customers, it's hard to make, hard to sell to them as a startup because they think, well, you're not going to be around in six months to service this product that I just bought for you. As you get more established, yes, you should have a lot. You'll, you'll that'll, that'll make it easier if you make sales. Right, it should. So the point is, even though that um, ratio for you may not be great right now, the goal is to improve it. And the goal is to improve it as much as you can, um, as quickly as you can. I'm going to give you an example here of how powerful this can be. So um, right before I came down here to start working at U of I, I was teaching a class at um, Kellogg School at Northwestern. And these were a couple of my students. This is Florence. She's from El Salvador, and Camilo, he's from Colombia. And they, after they graduated, they went down to Bogota, and they started a company called Layout. And it's a customer loyalty business. Um, and I, I like to tell a story about these two, is that they made a classic mistake when they were first pitching their business. You know, this is, a, you know, it's a business school. They were, they were like a, opportunities to this campus-wide pitch competition and so on. So they did that. They got the time for their eight-minute pitch. And these guys had done all their, all their research, but they took like the first four minutes of their eight-minute pitch trying to make a case that there's an emerging middle class in Latin America. And therefore, it's now an attractive market for um, somebody that's serving small and medium-sized retail, which they're trying to serve that emerging middle class. Now, well, I just made that case right there. It didn't take me four minutes, right? So they wasted half of their pitch on something that probably, it's like saying, um, if you um, were going to give your pitch for uh, AI, and you had eight minutes, and you took the first four minutes to just convince people that there's a healthcare crisis in America, all right? You've wasted four minutes. Yeah. <laughs> you should be able to make that case in about 30 seconds, or else you're just talking to people that you shouldn't be talking to. Right? But that's but but that but it worked out for them. So they launched this business in uh, June 2016, and here's where they were two years later. They started this business in a little neighborhood around a university in Bogota with lots of like college-oriented retail shops and things like that, theaters. Uh, um, grocery stores, uh, bodegas, whatever you want to call it, uh, restaurants. Um, and at that point in time, they were charging, this was a subscription-based service, they were charging $50 to $130 per location. So if it's a chain store, per store, right? And they, were, they had about $50,000 in monthly uh, average recurring revenue at that point in time, so 50000 times 12, $600,000 a year. Not a very big business, right? And they were generating average revenue per account of $140. Uh, and their monthly turn rate is 2.5%. So 2.5%, when you think about it, is a monthly turn rate is kind of high. That's like 30% a year. So you're going to, so every year, 30 out of every 100 customers you have is gone, okay? But what does this mean? I keep pointing at the screen, which is silly. 
they were charging, their customer acquisition cost at that point in time was about $198 per store, per location. Um, their customer lifetime value, when they calculated, was about $2,800 over the number of months that an average customer would be subscribing. So they had a ratio of their lifetime value of a customer to their customer acquisition cost of 14 times. All right, so that's a really big ratio. And, they, and, and in fact, they calculated that their customers, uh, so for the company, from the subscription revenue they were getting every month, it took them 2.9 months for them to get back the amount of money they had spent to actually acquire that customer. And then ever, everything after that 2.9 months was essentially Add into that lifetime value. All right. And so then what happened? They were growing super fast as a result. They were growing at 29% monthly month over month as a compound revenue growth rate. They were growing their, their end users, these are the actual shoppers that went into these stores and had their little loyalty card that they were using to make their work their purchases. That was growing at 26.5% per month, and so the total transaction growth for their customers was at 37.5% growth per month, and it made it easy for them to raise money. Since then, they've raised $22.5 million in venture capital. They've been featured all in all kinds of publications about fastest growing companies in Latin America. Um, they've expanded to Mexico, Honduras, Guatemala, and El Salvador and uh, the company is off the risks. So that's the, and, and what impressed me the most about Florence and Camillo is of sort of my former students, they've done just about the best job of tracking these metrics and, keep, and being able to make the case to investors to prove that they had a really scalable business model to justify um, raising the money they raised. So here's my poll question for everybody at the end of this presentation. First of all, raise your hand. How many of you think you need to raise your prices? That's really more related to what I talked about in April. Um, how many of you think you need to do a better job of understanding your customer acquisition costs and customer lifetime value? Okay, and how many of you say, forget it, I shouldn't be doing this. I should go to a different business. In America. It's an awesome place to make money. All right. Um, then here what I've got is sort of a, an exercise for you. Uh, I'm just going to show you this again, um, and I have an Excel spreadsheet version of this. Anybody that wants it, is there an easy way for us to just like share slides with everybody here? Yeah, if you just send it to us, we'll. Okay, so I will. Yeah. I'll, I'll send you the presentation as well as the Excel spreadsheet, yeah. which is basically just this. In um, it's got one as an example that's already filled out, and then two blank ones that you can one for subscriptions and one for traditional, and you can sort of play with it. And again, it's not going to solve all your problems or answer all your questions, but it's a way for you to start thinking about how you're going to keep track of and how you're going to manage your customer acquisition cost and customer lifetime value over time. And with that, I'm open to any questions that you have. Go ahead. Well, first of all, did I understand you correctly when you said don't spend a lot of money on marketing before you figure out your customer acquisition costs? Yep. Okay. So if, if you're an early stage company, and like you said, a lot of early stage companies, like you're just trying different things, you haven't figured out, like you maybe you don't have customers yet, mm -hmm. you're just, you know, maybe you're tempted to spend more money on marketing because you think that that's going to help you get more customers. How do you strike that balance between figuring out like, how do I acquire customers so I can figure out what the customer acquisition cost right. is and not spend a lot of money on marketing? Okay, um, how many of you have read The Lean Startup? That book? A bunch of you? So that's a great book. It's got what, 11 or 12 years old now. Um, the number one concept of that book is that a startup is not a business. It's a group of people who have come together to try and find a viable and repeatable and scalable business model. Everything you're doing up until then is experimenting. And so what I would encourage you to do is think about your sales and marketing. Now, there's nothing necessarily wrong with spending money to do experiments. You have to do that. You should be making like an experiment, you should be making a hypothesis, and then you should be testing that hypothesis. And as soon as you find out you have enough data to suggest that hypo hypothesis you made about whether this kind of customer wants your product, 
As soon as you have enough data to even to say that's not true, then you need to stop that experiment and start another one. If you are able to confirm that this is the right kind of customer, that's great. You confirmed it, but now you need to do some more experiments, like what's the best way to get it to them? What kind of revenue model should I have? What kind of pricing? You know, do they want to buy it in my Amazon store, or do they want to buy it directly off my website, or do they want it to be in the Granger catalog? You know, all of those are things that you can experiment with. And so when you think of them as experiments, I think that'll help you think about, well, let's be careful about how much money we're spending. Mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. Is that helpful? Yes. How many of you like having to bring in venture capital investors in your business? This is the first time that nobody's raised their hand. I'm really happy about that. Because um, every time you raise money from outside investors, you own less of your own business. You've got more people to answer to. The clock is ticking for you to start uh, and, and it's like, I, I almost think that you want to have as much as you can. I mean, many, many of you don't have enough resources to do everything you'd like to do right now, and I understand. But as much as possible, you'd like to have those experiments done before you start taking on a lot of money from outside investors. Because now, you're expected to execute. And um, it puts you in a much different different situation when you're if you're still doing ex experiments at that point in time. Make sense? Anyone else? All right. Well, good. Uh, thank you for coming. I hope this was helpful, and uh, we'll make sure you get a copy of these slides, and we'll get a copy of the Excel version of this so that you can uh, play around with it.